What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what is going on? It's Jay Campbell, of course, the founder of a bunch of different, a writer, excuse me, of a bunch of different books, and of course, now the founder of the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in studio by longtime friends, um, Dr. Scott Howe and Dr. Keith Nichols of, of Tier One Health and Performance in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm not mistaken, right? <laughs> Tier one health and wellness. You got it, man. Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, so Keith and I go way back. Uh, Scott and I have known each other for about a year and a half, a little bit longer. And these guys are honestly the literally tip of the spear when it comes to hormone optimization. And not just hormone optimization, but really understanding the science um, as it's explained and as it's as Keith always likes to say, to the state of the the state of the science when it comes to evidence. Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about a lot of things today on this podcast. I plan on making this podcast the best, if not one of the best of all time. And the goal is, of course, to make it the best for men who want to understand how to optimize their hormones the right way and obviously in the context of health and safety. But before we jump into all the topics, I just want, you know, for the people that don't know you, and obviously most people are going to know you guys, but for the new people who don't, you know, just talk a little bit about your background, you know, how you got here on this podcast here today. I'll start with you, Keith. Well, I'm a director of Tier 1 Health and Wellness. I've been doing this for well over a decade. Uh, uh, my specialty is physical medicine rehabilitation. I was a spine and sports specialist for the last 25 or so years, uh, slowly uh uh, began a practice in uh, hormone replacement therapy. Uh, once I went through uh, the devastating effects of, uh, you know, testosterone deficiency, I was misdiagnosed, mismanaged, went through every treatment you could imagine, worked up for cancer. I mean, we've gone through that in previous podcasts, but uh, why do I do what I do now? Because of what I went through and to help others avoid going through what I went through. So that, that's awesome. I do what I do. Awesome. And uh, go ahead, Scott. Uh, my expertise is in androgen metabolism. That's what I've focused on for the past 15, 20 years of my life. So I've really dug into the adverse effects. And it was by chance that I met uh, Dr. Nichols. You know about that story. I sure. sent emails out to all the prominent physicians <laughs> about their use of aromatase inhibitors. And who was the sole physician that responded? It was Dr. Nichols, and he did not prescribe aromatase inhibitors. So since that point, we have seen eye to eye on every span of the literature. So there's not anything that we haven't uh, discussed yet that we have disagreed on. So our interpretation of this evidence, and um, uh, my last PhD was in epidemiology. And so I really uh, dug into that. And I uh, published my uh, six year study last year in August. Nice. So that's something that's coming back up. but. Uh, uh, so my specialty is in androgen metabolism. So I really dig into interpreting research, the statistical analysis, how that is interpreted, and what is actually meaningful for studies. It's something I just did for World Link Medical. So uh, that's my background. Awesome. And, you know, as I've said before, and for the people that do know us and know of the podcast, and of course, Keith and I have done Fuck, dude, a lot of podcasts <laughs> yeah. together. <laughs> and we go way back. And, you know, very truthfully, and, you know, Keith said this to me before, and, 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 and we're, not, we're not tooting anyone's horns here, but, you know, together we've done the world a lot of good. You know, there's been a lot of men and women who have been helped, you know, from not just watching our podcast, but from working with you, you know, from getting information with Scott. I mean, the world is, the world is a better place with all three of us putting information into the universe. And so today I plan on making this probably the best one that we've ever done yet. Um, and, and, and again, obviously guys, um, if you do watch this podcast and you are considering hormone optimization, Keith works in majority of States now, right? Like what States can you not practice in? Well, I'm, I'm right now I'm focused on California, Florida, Alabama, Tennessee. 
Okay. And then for anybody else though, just to clarify, because I always do this, you will absolutely work with them, but they have to fly in and you have to lay hands on them one time, correct? Just one time. Then after that, it's all offsite. Exactly. And I, and I will thank you. We appreciate you very much. I get patients every week uh, that uh, come in from previous podcasts that's in the Jay Campbell show. So we yep. awesome. thank you very much. Of course, man. And, and, and I love both of you guys and I appreciate you guys for doing this podcast and we're going to make magic. Um, so let's go into the first one. Now, uh, let me just say that th these guys have done a lot of legwork and prepared slides and we're going to go down that path too, but we're going to kind of jump around a little bit to start. Um, so the first point, and I really have wanted to make this comment and it was kind of hard in the past as Keith knows because we were doing shows <laughs> with a lot of doctors together. And so, you know, you don't want to ever disparage doctors. And obviously I never do because without you guys, I wouldn't have a place and a forum to talk about the things that I do. But it's very important, as you guys know, we're in 2020 now, to really come to an understanding for the community at large to know this. And so the first point is the lack of physician awareness in hormone optimization. And, you know, Keith used a really good comment that testosterone windmill clinics are essentially becoming the new pill mills, which if you guys are familiar with like pain, you know, pain drug prescribing and all that nonsense that went on and how they are doing harm for so many prospective patients who have been, you know, essentially really screwed up. So I'll go to you guys, you guys, who, who wants to start talking about that? Well, you know, um, I think a lot of this is predicated, these uh, TRT mills that pop up, they have uh, what we have dubbed the box syndrome. They look at these guidelines. They don't have any reasoning ability to interpret anything. They're can. They want to push people through a practice. So it's numbers. It's actually numbers. And that's one of the things that sets us apart, but I won't go into that. Um, the reliance just on bro science, and a lot of it's bro science. Right. We, we've talked about it several times. It's bro science. It trickles over. They get a guy to come in. They put him on a, a protocol, mm -hmm. and then <laughs> that's it. Okay? And what harm are they doing in the long term? What about their uh, skeletal density? Right. What about their cardiac health? So uh, that's a, just a major point. Yeah, they, you know, they're opening up like like Starbucks on every corner now. The T mills, and unfortunately, uh, they they'll use their protocols. Uh, I will tell you that every patient that comes to see me from out of state has seen an average of at least three clinics before they make it to me. Keith, that is astounding. That's an average. That's there have been crazy. some men that have been to six and seven clinics, but. They've all visited these T mills because of uh, cost, cost first and foremost. Uh, they operate uh, by the mere fact that they just throw enough testosterone to someone, a lot of men will feel better, and they will, unless they, some guys are just blasting and cruising. Anyway, they just want their testosterone. But some guys really, really, um, the majority of guys really need help and are really suffering. And they get started on all these complicated protocols. And they just end up worse than, than when they went in. And so uh, I see some men that are really uh, uh, they're really in bad shape by the time they make it here. Yeah. And, and let me just throw that. And you guys know this, but, you know, to, a case in point, you know, to prove that we're not BSing is testosteroneaddiction.com. You know, go to that site. I mean, yes, that woman means well, obviously. And there's obviously bad information there. But as you guys know, there's testimonies from hundreds, if not thousands of men and women who have gone through the experiences that you guys talk about. I mean, keep thinking about that. Seeing four <clears throat> to six doctors. Absolutely. And still, as you know, and you've told me this a million times and you taught me this, never get their hormones optimized. That's right. Never. We'll talk about that today. Exactly why and how easy it really can be and how complicated they actually make it. So uh, it's not that complicated. No, it really isn't. No, no. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the, pro the problem is Jay is that uh, following evidence-based medicine is boring right because it's just applying the literature to the patient showing what benefits the in the research will benefit the patient but it becomes very boring uh men for whatever reason have to overcomplicate matters in order for it to be more effective you know if it's simple it must not be very effective it's got to be a complicated protocol for it to be truly effective and that's just not true but unfortunately that's trickled down from the uh bodybuilding world where they're on multiple anabolic substances, and it is a much more complicated world than bioidentical hormone replacement therapy for middle-aged men and women. Yeah, and you guys have both said, and I, I'll, this, the second point is connected to this point, which is obviously the harm being done. I want you to talk about this. The harm being done to patients who haven't had their T and their thyroid and everything else optimized, and I'm sure Scott has slides you can throw up, but I mean, Keith, you were the one that really taught me this, and I want you to be 
you know, transparent. A lot of doctors who don't know shit are also attempting to pay their bills, right? And they have mortgages and second cars and college tuition and all these things. And so they, they, they attempt probably in good faith to help. But when they, as you said, they don't know the evidence and they don't have any understanding or recognition themselves of using the hormones, what happens? Oh, yeah. I mean, well, you know, you, the, the patients ends up wor- end up worse than better and you actually harm their health instead of benefiting them. You know, but, but you see it quite often, Jay, uh, you know, these, these clinics where the physicians, I mean, I have patients come in and, the, and it's literally an open prescription. They walk in and what do you want? You tell me, in fact, the patients will come to you and say, look, the reason I'm here is because when I went to these other clinics, I felt like I was educating them, telling them what to do right. to me. And they were just yeah. writing the prescription. It's amazing. And where were they getting their information? Most of the patients are getting their information off of forums where, you know, you've got a lot of truth mixed with fiction. Well, you know, a, a big issue is why is uh, younger men uh, reaching out for testosterone replacement? Right. Why is that? Yeah. You, it, that's the big elephant in the room, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because they can get it. Well, I'm going to transition into some slides now because I think. Yeah, please uh, do. Please do. Oh, wow. You go, you guys are ready. <laughs> so um, we have a mission here at Tier 1 uh, Center for Research in Tier 1 Health and Wellness. And it's com- to compile the evidence to justify treating symptoms, not numbers. Now, Jay, um, I don't say this lightly, but we have really been busy. I can tell. We've identified nearly 20 mechanisms that... Uh, we are keeping confidential, but there are me- mechanisms that interfere with androgen metabolism and distribution in the body. Uh, so the mechanisms. Uh, this is why Keith never comes on my podcast. <laughs> 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 well, these mechanisms, seriously, they nullify normal reference intervals for any man. So when I ask you about why are normal or more individuals seeking treatment, well, we have mechanisms to show why this occurs. So there was a study, I believe it was in 2006, uh, that actually stated there is not a a population-based reference interval that exists. Instead, it's an interval for each individual. And based on that concept, uh, Dr. Keith Nichols and I have walked through the literature for the past year, and we have found uh, over 20 mechanisms that influence that. So before, I'm not going to uh, go too deep into the distribution and metabolism, but on the EDCs, uh, this is a big issue that not many people are talking about. And if you look at how <clears throat> EDCs actually function, the many ways that they can disrupt the endocrine system, they can act like antagonists. They can fully bind as a ligand to androgen receptors. And then they can work as uh, different levels of antagonists. They can work as competitive inhibitors. And uh, this means that they just bind to one site on the receptor and then prevent the action from actually going through. Now, on the other side of that, there's non-competitive antagonists that work. And when these bind, they bind by a non-covalent bonding, so they can be washed out of the receptor, right? What happens if an EDC is an irreversible antagonist? It can't be washed out. It It actually competes and fully inhibits the action of androgen receptor signaling. So... There's also um, uh, different situations where an EDC can be a full-on inhibitor, and it can be an inhibitor of an enzyme, a a protein that has some function in the body, and we all know what that that happens. So the big issue here is uh, the the most predominant factor with EDCs, like uh, bisphenol A and others, is that exposure depends largely on length of exposure and timing of exposure rather than a traditional dose response. So uh, a typical exposure is non-monotonic. It doesn't follow a normal dose response. 
it's accumulated, it accumulates in tissues, and it's manifested over uh, chronic environmental dose levels. So even detecting the EDC in the man is bad. Okay, so I got to ask you a question on that. So chronic dose levels, um, define that more, you know, lay or, you know, drill down a little bit more granular on that. Is that just talking about somebody who's literally exposed to Tupperware? Yes. Uh, in, any type of plastics, any type of lotions that contain <laughs> bisphenol, phthalates, in, any type of plasticizers, things like that that go. And I have some slides that are probably going to uh, raise some eyebrows coming awesome. up, but it is a big deal. And what we'll see in the next three slides is that the mixtures of these, the different types of plastics, the right. different types of EDCs, they don't just have a singular effect. Right. They have a multiplier effect Wow! when it comes to actual the effects that are measured uh, in uh, vitro. So, um, you know, something that always gets thrown up is desensitization to the androgen receptor. Right. Uh, do you know of any mechanisms that cause that? Uh, desensitization. I mean, pro I mean, I, I'm just theorizing probably like somebody that would be using like polypharmacy and high dosages. Well, it, it, here's the issue with that. Even with high doses, desensitization of the androgen receptor doesn't recur or it doesn't occur. It's uh, called autoregulation. The androgen receptor gene regulates the number of androgen receptors based on the amount of androgens in that tissue. So when there's physiologic concentrations, and this can go from, say you're taking 50 milligrams of testosterone, you move to 250, you move to 500, you move to 1,000, you move to 2,000, and then at gram doses, it upregulates. It doesn't downregulate. There is no ceiling on it. So when this uh, keeps on getting brought up, it's, um, it's sort of comical mm -hmm. to us here. So uh, androgen receptors will upregulate with those. So if someone's been on uh, 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 testosterone therapy, they have no issue with desensitization of the androgen receptors. The only tissue that it does not work in is when someone has castration resistant prostate right. cancer. Right. And it works in reverse. When the androgen levels go down, the AR goes up. Right. So, so Keith, this is why you always said, and Neil obviously agreed with you that you had to outcompete the receptors. And so that no amount, there's no really limiting dose of testosterone to get a man feeling better correct correct that was a good time yeah it really was so <clears throat> basically based off our uh mission here what we want to do at tier one uh, center for research is take morgan taylor's argument from 2016 and move past what he had and make it into something that's fully developed and entirely different. And the paper, we're working on a paper right now. We're working on an op-ed that's gonna set the stage uh, and we hope to like push an impetus in the medical literature uh, to recognize type three hypogonadism because we've identified the mechanisms there that actually occur. And uh, the, some of the mechanisms I found have over a 40% variation in sensitivity to androgens. Wow. So, with that, we're trying to push that in the literature to eventually uh, be recognized. And we've mapped out a load of mechanisms. I just can't tell you how many. So are you guys gonna call this testosterone resistance syndrome as short as a slang for it, or are you gonna call it type three hypergonadism? We hope to, we hope to redefine a, a, a type three hypergonadism, Jay, which is a man with normal levels yeah. with symptoms. So with um, the EDCs, uh, what I have on here right now is structural activity relationships. And so we're looking at uh, these SARS, we call them uh, SARS in pharmacology. And most people know that SARS are, uh, predicate the effect of any drug that's uh, taken into the body. So in this study, they screened 397 chemicals uh, for uh, androgen receptor antagonism. So they're wanting to see if it interferes with the androgen receptor. And they did this by sensitive uh, reported gene assay. So in their own training set, what is really interesting here, in their own training set, 45.7% of that 
397 chemicals exhibited inhibitory activity against transcription induced by synthetic androgen R1881. Now, Jay, have you ever heard of that? Mm -mm. Well, uh, R1881 is a methylated version of trimbolone <laughs> that never made it to market approval. And the reason why this anabolic is used in research like this is because it's one of the most potent anabolics ever synthesized. I, I, I don't know of one that I found yet that has higher bonding affinity to the AR, but that's why it's used here. It has a, upwards of 300 times the anabolic potency compared to methyl testosterone and over eight, 80 times the androgenic potency compared to methyl testosterone. But the binding affinity to the androgen receptor, progesterone receptor, and glucocorticoid receptor is what makes it ideal in this type of research setting because it has a high binding affinity to every one of those. So if an EDC interferes with the binding of R1881, then we know we have a big freaking problem. Right. That is substantial. So that's the reason why this is used. And in this study, they identified 239 chemicals that were competitive inhibitors of AR. You think about that on a daily basis, what you're exposed to. Yeah. And then they predicted that over 14,000 would be AR antagonists. So they used a model to predict these other chemicals based on the structural activity relationships. Wow. So... I pulled this study because it, it went right into uh, what we're discussing from here. And this looked at different uh, chemicals that mimic or antagonize the androgen receptor. Now, here again, you'll see that they use R1881 to measure these bonding affinities against. And if you look at the figure uh, to the bottom left in figure two, you'll see that there's inactive, weak, moderate, and strong. Okay. So 56 of the chemicals that they looked at were inactive. 72 chemicals had weak AR bonding. 60 chemicals had moderate AR bonding affinity. And 14 chemicals had strong AR bonding affinity. So if you look at that, we have the capacity to be exposed to 14 chemicals per day that have a strong bonding affinity to the androgen receptor that is comparable to the strongest androgen ever created. Wow. So if the table uh, three to the right, that shows the relative mean binding affinities. And what you look at is the strongest here are the diphenylmethanes, PCBs, organochlorines, and phthalates. So that's just every single EDC that we're looking at. But what happens when you mix them together? And so I included this one because it was really important. In my mind, it was really important. Because and, and by the way, let me just add, add something to that because you had phytoestrogens were in there too. Think about all the garbage burgers that they're creating in the quote unquote vegan movement, right? The impossible <laughs> burger. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I think about if that. Any of those have ever been analyzed. Oh, dude. There's more, there's more phytoestrogen in the impossible burger that they did analyze this because this was like two weeks ago. Somebody sent me the study, but there's more, more phytoestrogen in impossible burger than there is in three months supply of male birth control. I, I didn't hear that, but that's, that's interesting. <laughs> it is to say the least. So, you know, these mixtures, when we're moving from a single exposure to when we're combining multiple chemicals, that, mimics what we experience on a daily basis. Right. It's not just a single chemical, it's multiple uh, chemicals. So what this study examined was bisphenol mixtures that consider more accurately what, what we actually experience on a daily basis. So what they found was when BPA, BPF, and BPS were combined, this increased the wow. endocrine disrupting activity at a lower concentration than when each EDC was assessed alone for its own activity. So what this did with estrogens, they found that combinations of the bisphenol upregulated the estrogen receptor transactivation activity. That just means it's signaling. And then a combined bisphenol mixture modulated the androgen receptor, more importantly, 
And this transaction occurred at lower concentrations than the, than the initial concentration for each single one. Wow. So when you look at a mixture, it confounds the effect that we're seeing. And it's... <laughs> I mean, again, uh, look around. Look at all the young men of today, right? Yeah. This is it right here. It is. Well, you know, um, one of the things, I put this slide up here because I wanted people to understand uh, the Center for Research. And uh, Tier 1 Health and Wellness um, is a preventative medicine practice, and it's focusing on preventing chronic disease and extending quality of life. Now, Number one is all you guys need to put out there, no open war on misinformation. Well, we're getting ready to hit it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's going to get bigger? <laughs> yeah, it's getting bigger. So uh, the mission... At He's tier, just getting warmed up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the mission at Tier 1 Center for Research is to disseminate accurate information in the field of preventative medicine, but also other fields. Uh, using the best available evidence. And you know you've interacted with us a lot. Uh, the first time I met you, what type of paper did I send you about podcast topics? Insane. We look at evidence. Keith and I look at evidence, and that's what we do the best. Yep. So we intend to make an impact on not only the crisis of EDCs, but to counter all this misinformation that's being put out. All the BS. Well, it's BS and it's being uh, spread on multiple platforms and, and YouTube channels. So we opened war and I'm declaring this right now awesome. on the podcast. Please. We're opening war on misinformation and misrepresentation of credentials. So one of the biggest things that we face here is non-factual information and it has become commonplace for individuals to get up on podcasts and appeal to a self-made title without any supporting evidence for what they say, the claims that they make, the arguments that they build, and they represent themselves as researchers or physicians, uh, misrepresenting their credentials, and this misleads the audience. And I'm not saying anything bad about anyone that is not a physician, but has some expertise in the field. What I'm saying is when someone purposefully misaligns the audience, so if you talk about treating patients and talk about increasing doses of testosterone, then what medical school did you go to? What residency program did you go in? What fellowship were you in? If you talk about being a researcher, where did you earn your PhD? What was your thesis topic on? How many studies do you have indexed in PubMed? That's what's missing from all this. Over the past two weeks, I've seen at least three people represent themselves as professional researchers without any credentials whatsoever. So uh, it's gotten so bad that not only we've decided to open this war on misinformation, but we're going to counter it at any time it comes out. So this is like the warning call to everyone. If you're putting misinformation out, we're going to drill you down. We're going to cut you down at the knees. So it's it started and it started now. So one of the things that makes us different from other practices is there isn't another practice that has an on-site PhD conducted in re research. There isn't. There is one practice in the UK that claims that they have an on-site researcher, but this guy's just hired to do a blog. Um, so my, I guess my point here is it's not to go out on a pedestal. I just hate when misinformation goes out. Do you agree with that? Tom? Of course. Of course. It's misinformation hurts people. But you guys are going to have a big job ahead of you because the internet allows idiots to put forth information and yeah, it's everywhere. So, so well, you I know that you, but you guys got a big task ahead of you. <laughs> well, you know, um, uh, Jay, we covered a lot of misinformation in the beginning. We, I know. we all tackled it, remember? No, absolutely. Nothing has changed, but I'm just, I'm just saying I'm really glad, A, that you're doing this, but B, get ready because it's a big yep. nice job. And I haven't even, even brought up the whole idea, as Keith always says, about the endocrine society. I mean, for God's sakes, the endocrine society doesn't even care about being evidence-based. No. Well, they ignore so many other factors. And then when we put this op-ed out, that's number four on this slide. When we put this op-ed out, we're redefining what normal means. 
and we're using every mechanism that we have identified that influences androgen metabolism in the literature. So what are you guys going to do when you get attacked? Because you know you're good attacked. Well, we're ready. <laughs> we're always ready. You just have to defend it with the medical evidence, you know. <laughs> well, that's one of the things. We never shot away from thoughts. No, I guess not. No, no, I know. But we all know that they don't want the truth. So good luck. No, I not. know you guys are the right guys to do it. And I'm glad that I'm putting this out there. So I'm, I'm really proud of you. This is epic. And this is definitely needed. Well, so um, I guess uh, from this point on, I'll, I'll talk about what we're doing. Um, we're submitting to Lancet Hematology, uh, myself, uh, Dr. Nichols, and then Dr. Rousier. Uh, we're uh, working on a piece to submit to Lancet Hematology. It's actually a portion of a study um, uh, that was, um, it's a subset of a study that was published last year. It's a six year study, and we're gonna uh, submit that to Lancet Hematology. We just submitted a confidential submission uh, for a major sport organization. And um, this was with myself and uh, Dr. Nichols. And this one is gonna make some headlines. So we'll update you on that. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a big deal. We've been working on a lot of uh, different papers since we actually uh, came on your podcast last time. Um, we did one, a testosterone vitamin D review uh, with me, Dr. Nichols, and some collaborators from Brazil and uh, Spain. But this op-ed is the big issue. Yeah. Because if we can get the message out in the right way this first time, we can really make an impact on this. And uh, um, I reached out to Dr. Rousier because when I saw him present, I went to uh, Hormones and Beyond in October, and I saw him present. He's one of the only physicians besides Dr. Nichols here that has mastery of the literature. And he, he was just blowing my mind every, every time he puts stuff up and he talked about it, his mastery of it. So that's it. So uh, we did several things. We've uh, had several uh, submissions that we've had over 2019, uh, but we have one of the largest androgen metabolism libraries um, that's available. That's awesome. Now, not only on that, I, we have nearly 40,000 studies that start from the 1900s all the way up to the present day, and we update it 10 to 15 per day. Um, so wait, wait, wait a minute. How many of them show that blocking estrogen is, is, is not harmful? Well, blocking? we're coming to that. Oh, we're going to get to that, Jake. Don't worry. You won't be disappointed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have to get I'm through the – uh, guys softball. You know, I mean, I, I think that Dr. Howell was pointing out that uh, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, a lot of work. I mean, you know, do you think that it's really – uh, enjoy what we be from uh, family and friends and uh, right. reading about EDCs and, and reading these papers. You can see right. it's a, not a sexy subject, but we're hoping to uh, hopefully help men in the future and, and get treatment where they, where they previously can't right now. Yeah. It's well, you know, uh, we have a mission here and the whole intent of our work is threefold and we align on this. Everyone in the practice aligns on it. The first is we intend to bridge the gap between these faulty consensus guidelines that we know are just not nonsense. Accurate. Yeah. And how physicians integrate uh, uh, evidence into clinical based practice that that's just a, a foundation. The second is to create more public awareness to the major uh, epidemic of EDC's exposure. That's something uh, I, I really appreciate that you've done, Jay. Thank you. It really is. And we intend to keep on driving that home. Awesome. The third is we intend to push for this new classification of a type three hypogonadism. Um, and if you saw the mechanisms that we've mapped out and saw the variation between man to man, when you can measure 40% variation from one man to the next, is there a normal reference interval that exists for a population? No. So we're, going to try our best to drive that home and maybe with your help and help of others we can uh, do better with that but for sure that that is basically our mission segment so we call it open war we're we're in for it right well i'm really glad you guys and obviously now i know why you guys have been on the dl for so long that's awesome that you guys have put this together I'm, i mean honestly this is epic man i'm really really glad that this is going to be pushed out there now because it's needed man you know, Jay, I'm, I'm just going to briefly mention this. This is other stuff we've been involved with. Uh, Keith and I are going to present at WorldLink this year on androgen receptors and EDCs. 
So we've developed physician training courses, CMEs, uh, awesome. to gain, uh, to, so we can teach physicians how to interpret studies, awesome. statistical literacy. I mean, about 30 to 40% of uh, physicians aren't statistically literate. Wow. And it's a big, it's a big issue. Yeah. We have collaborations with NIH researchers. Heck, we just had a test that was sent to us by one. And we hope to have some good data to present at uh, uh, the World Link Conference. But I've also reached out to a lot of anabolic steroid researchers. And that's, you know, one of the things that um, uh, I'm going to talk about here in a second. But those are what we're doing. Now, I had this... Um, I've had a long set of discussions over the past year with Keith and um, it was suggested that I provide consultations and I started to because my specialty is in androgen metabolism. By the way, I look at number three, it just screams at me. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what, I've done, <laughs> what I've done is I've, I've actually, um, I've, I've actually started scheduling guys and um, you know, it's a real soft spot to me because I, I studied uh, illicit androgen abuse by athletes and bodybuilders. And that's even how I come to know you right. and Dr. Nichols and Keith just one day he told me, he's like, why don't you do what's in your specialty? Yeah. It's awesome. You know, why don't you talk? And, and, and so I took his advice and I did that. And after thinking about all this misinformation by like this guy, Tony huge that you see, Oh, Jesus. You heard him? Yeah, of course. <clears throat> I gotta get you, Scott, I got to get you on Ben Pakulski's podcast. That's the guy you got to get on the podcast for. for well, you know, right here. after watching that one video with him, I'm thinking to myself, what in the world is going on? And then after hearing some podcasts on muscular development of all places. Oh, dude. Half awesome. the information was wrong. And well, we, we know why that is, but yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, so – you know, here we focus on optimization and we want individuals to have a health based paradigm. Exactly. But some individuals are into a chemical living paradigm. Right. Right. And a lot of anabolic steroid users get into that mindset. And it's something that uh, no, there's no one else that knows the evidence like I do in this area. And it's something that I've really focused my adult life on. And so, um, now, my intent in these co consultations is to provide evidence for the different types of harm. And this is just not education and, and guidance of how to use different compounds and things like that. Right. Obviously, that is part of it because you want to reduce harm. Of course. It goes further. And the, the further part is to motivate a paradigm shift towards health. Where you were once in this, you start to think about your life in a different way. And you start to value your health. And I think that uh, a lot of guys um, that are locked into anabolic steroids, um, you know, it's just, it's just a bad situation because it's hard to get out of. I've been there myself and I come out of it. Right. Well, I'm so glad that, I, let, me, well let me just say this first. First off, this is awesome. Okay. Point blank because it's very needed. And as you said, without mentioning names, the majority of physicians quote unquote in that community don't know their elbow from their asshole. Let's be really honest. The shit that they put out on Facebook, on social media, on places is reprehensible. And as you said, Scott, causing harm. So this is extremely needed. And, you know, again, there'll be pushback, you know, from people of like, well, well, how does he know more than me? I mean, I already know. We know how it is. But this is awesome because you're right, man. Most of this stuff online is not accurate. Well, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't want to say that um, I, want to, I don't want to come off as being like this arrogant prick, but I really do know the literature probably better than 99.9% .9 of the people on the planet. Right. And what I, uh, I do in these risk uh, profiles is I do a risk to benefit for the individual. I map these SARS, the structural activity relationships, interaction effects. And then I map some SNPs. It's awesome. Some different genetic variants. And the reason why I do that is these have a very, well, they have to be mapped out. And we yeah. have, have a ton of them, but it's all towards protecting the health of the of individual. Of course. 
Uh, so um, th- actually, let me ask you a question though around that because this this opens up a really good can of worms for your practice. Are you guys going to then start mapping your patients um, even for optimization? Are you going to have them start doing DNA tests too so you look at certain SNPs that may be preventative? It's on the horizon. There you go. Beautiful. It is on I mean, the obviously horizon. Obviously, this is something Keith and I talked about three years ago. It has to happen, for God's sakes. Um, well, it's it's already in the works. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, the information I, I provide uh, to these individuals is something that's it really hasn't been put out before because I'm merging advances in uh, uh, toxicology, bioinformatics, and genetics all in one. And so these individuals come to me and I do that. But that's just what I'm doing with that. So if an individual is, uh, you know, they're needing guidance on anabolic harms, all that stuff, PIEDs, the first thing is to reduce their harm. And the next is to make sure that they uh, don't kill themselves in the process. But beyond that, <clears throat> um, what I believe that I provide is a new level of understanding of the individual. And that's one of the things I try to build a rapport with everyone and have them look at their health in a different way. So that's, that's just that's the awesome. part of that. So here's a metformin trial. <clears throat> you requested that. <laughs> I love it. So um, this is a, a present for you, um, Jay. <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> so um, we had several uh, uh, patients, several mm-hmm. people contact us over uh, asking if they should take their metformin. Uh, <laughs> because Dr. Adia said say why he shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm just, I'm going to walk through this. I'm not really going to dig into it really deep like I do. I don't want to lose a lot of people. And that's so, Jay's note. He's already put out a very good, very good, uh, you know, uh, op-ed on this already. Very good job, Jay. Thanks, man. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, the, for those of you who do not uh, really know what metformin does, it decreases hepatic glucose output. Right. And it has some other like signaling uh, effects with the mTOR and the different pathways in the body. Um, uh, so, I, you know, I watched the video, Rhonda Patrick. Do you know her? Of course, yeah. You know, she actually has some reasonable videos on uh, on metformin as far as the pros and cons. But in this uh, uh, study, we're going to look at it. Right. So, and By the way, this is the one, just for clarification purposes, that they're all looking at, right? Dr. Atia is looking at this one, right? This is the one. Probably. Yeah. And b- basically what it showed was a blunting of right. the hypertrophy right. response. But... Here, I want, I want everybody to just look at the estimates as we go through because it's, it's a little bit different than what you might expect. Of course. So we see this on the front page. So uh, there was 55 in the placebo, 54 in the metformin group. And, you know, these were randomized, obviously. Right. And you see the randomization chart on the right yep. of what actually occurred. Uh, so there was about a 32, 23 uh, split between female and male right. in the placebo and the 29-25 split in the metformin between the female and male. So they were roughly the same, males and females. Um, so the average age here was almost 70 years old. <laughs> so, and look at the BMIs. The BMIs in the placebo were 25.7 oh, and, and, and the metformin 26.9. But uh, this physical activity scale, right. where I have the arrows, they, the metformin group scored lower on the physical activity scale. But as you'll see here in a second, it almost seems like they lied on the physical activity scale. So uh, the placebo was about 10 points higher on this scale. So enough of that. So these are the raw estimates, uh, Jay, and the metformin's on the right and placebo's on the right. Well, at baseline on the extension, um, this was thir- uh, 39.8. And if you look at the baseline on the metformin, it was 53.4. So do you see why these people might have lied on their activity questionnaire? At baseline, they have higher knee extension strength than the 1RM right. than the placebo. Right. But look at maximum voluntary isometric contraction. Lower in the placebo than in the metformin. The power, 256 baseline placebo. 327 baseline in the metformin group. 
relative a knee strength 3.43, 4.40 in the metformin group. So each one of these baseline measures, even for the muscle biopsies they did, the metformin group was higher at baseline. Now, if you look at the average changes across that 14 week period, the placebo group, it was 48.6. So if there was a blunting of the strength, strength re response, wouldn't you expect that uh, placebo group to be higher? Yep. But in the metformin group, it was higher. It's 60.6. And look at the isometric contraction. The metformin group was 177. The placebo was 152. Every one of these measures, it's right. the same. If uh, at 14 weeks of metformin, the power in the metformin group was 368.8, and in the placebo, it was 310. Right. So higher on every measure, even when it's, uh, they looked at the actual. So, so if stuff. they're really looking at the researchers that Rhonda Patrick works with or Dr. Atia works with, they're really looking at these as you are and we are right here on this podcast. How are they coming to these conclusions? Well, there is a trend towards blunting. And see, if there was some salient characteristic that made these groups incomparable, which it obviously seems they are incomparable because the baselines are on average so much higher, then uh, the rate of change is what you would look at. But are these meaningful? This population was on average 70 years 70 old. 70 years old, right. So is this an accurate uh, crossover to what would happen in a male on TRT? At 45? Absolutely not. I doubt not. So, um, so the main thing about this study is uh, you know, look at some of the estimates, see if it makes sense, and then make your own judgment about it. I, Keith, I, Keith, in all of your years of prescribing metformin to your patients, have you ever had an outcome where a patient came back to you and said, Keith, I can't build muscle, it's the metformin? No, never. And if you think about it before these studies came out, how many people did you hear complain of that at all? <laughs> I mean, you look at the guys Never. posting their selfies, ripped to shreds on metformin, on their testosterone. I mean, you just didn't see it. So you get a, you know, the, the results get exactly. So I have to different. ask you guys, and Scott, you're the guy, is this the pharmaceutical companies not wanting this drug again in circulation because of so many health benefits that it offers? Well, you know, um, as far as big pharma and stuff like that, um, I think everyone knows my position on that. Yeah. I'm pretty critical of any pharmaceutical re related interest. If you look at the 2007 law that um, required pharmaceutical companies to report to clinicaltrials.gov, if you see the follow-up right. for how many trials that were made to report, half of them didn't report. Why did they not report? Because the data would have caused them financial harm. Exactly. But they broke federal law, but they're not getting arrested. No. They set the laws. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, so, okay. So before though, we, we walk away because you just proved it. So then again, why are people like Dr. Peter Atia, who's a brilliant doctor, who's well-regarded, you know, he's on the Joe Rogan podcast, you know, why are they saying this? I mean, where is it coming from? Well, you know, I think they're looking at the uh, overall trends. I'm not sure if it is, um, you know, if it's bias and interpreting the research. I know Rhonda Patrick, uh, her breakdown was, it was reasonable. Yeah. What she was saying was actually because in uh, the aerobic study that was done, there was a blunting there. There was a blunting here. So right. are we uh, transferring well, the benefits we get from weight training to a drug, right. are we just going to completely transfer it to that, or are there still benefits if of you're going to weight train? Yeah. So you know, it's sort of common sense to me that if an individual's taking it and they're making gains in the gym, they're only scared because this study come out the nonsense that they read. Right. right. Well, I mean, again, you guys read the article that you know that I wrote, and we compiled all the data. But I do agree, you know, and and, and Stan efforting. You know, remember, you remember Stan uh, Keith when we were up in Toronto, but, you know, he's one of the guys that came out and really interpreted the research and said, look, metformin's amazing for everybody, but, a great, you know, an ultra elite strongman, because again, as you guys talked about of the glucose inhibition, you know, and so, yes, you might have a maximum performance in that one moment of time event. 
that you probably should reconsider using metformin around your competition time, right? And so I agree with that. I mean, clear there's evidence about that, but none of the other stuff should make a person stop taking metformin who's wanting to live stronger and longer. It makes no sense. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. Beautiful. Um, yeah. Okay, Keith, well, you want to just start jumping around with some of the other topics that you had? Well, now I guess we can get into the nitty gritty nuts and bolts, Jay, that you and Joy yeah. so much. Yeah. Are yeah, you absolutely. ready for the, uh, you know, estrogen and such and protocols? And we might as well get down to some, uh, some of the nuts and bolts now. Okay. So let's talk right now then about transcrotal testosterone. Hey, we're going to get to that. Let's go. Uh, okay. Hey, you guys what got, I've made you is not really a talk. These slides are talking points for us to discuss. There okay, are perfect, slides, perfect. So let's use them as talking points. Oh, I didn't know you guys had more. I thought I was just hey, looking hey, at the this, back. Here, 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 yeah, here, we got a lot. More. Here comes my section. You ready? I knew you'd want this <laughs> section. I, I made this section just for you. All right? In a different let's way. Let's go. All right? All right, man. Iron sharpens iron. You know that. Yep. All right, let's go back and look at the uh, history of uh, our reference values for testosterone. This was a study done back in 2007, our paper written, uh, Morgan Toller was one of the authors on the paper, but they looked at the uh, reference values for testosterone in at least 25 different local labs there. And if you'll notice, the upper value ranged from 486 to 1,593 nanograms per deciliter. This is 2007, so in some labs, that was a normal value. Right. Uh, I'll tell you that when I first uh, had my testosterone tested, uh, the lab value at that time for LabCorp in Nashville, Tennessee was 250 to 1500. I measured out at 254. So back then, 1500 was a normal value. Right. All right. So out came the paper in 2007, a population level decline in serum testosterone levels in American men. In that study, they observed a substantial age-independent decline in testosterone that does not appear to be attributable to observed changes in that planetary factors, including health and lifestyle characteristics, such as smoking and obesity. The estimated population level declines are greater in magnitude than cross-sectional declines in T testosterone, typically associated with age. So they looked at the decline from 1987, basically to 2004. And what they found, there was about a 17% reduction in testosterone, or about 1.2% per year. At the end of this study, they hypothesized that the observed age match decline in serum testosterone is due to some undocumented historical <laughs> temporary influence, health related or environmental. It's the aliens. Age. That's right. Aliens. So the point is, is that we have this unexplainable possible environmental cause of this significant decline in men's testosterone levels. Yep. So we can acknowledge that there's been a, been a decline that, that we cannot explain, but yet what do we do? The same researcher, Dr. Travison, develops our harmonized reference ranges for circulating testosterone levels. Unbelievable. Our normal ranges came from actually 400 men. There were four, there were four actual studies going on in Europe and America. And out of 9,000 men, they, they randomly took 100 from each of those studies. And that's where our normal values came from. They were, of course, in men aged 19 to 39 years of age, uh, their BMI less than 30. They did not evaluate these men or test these men for symptoms. They just made sure they weren't obese, all right? And our new normal values have come out to be 264 to 916 nanograms per deciliter. So in 2007, you could go to a lab in 1500 or 1593 was normal. Now, in 2017, you've got a 916 upper limit of normal. So, so there is literally no way logically that you can say that they are not attempting to lower testosterone levels in man as a, and, and make it acceptable in society, correct? Well, I think what's happening is because we're a lab-centric society, and, we, and I think the problem is taking population averages and developing normal values, that that's the problem. Yeah. Because what we've got now, as you've seen from the previous study, is our normal range is the average for a population of sick, poisoned men. That's true. That's true. And then there's all those mechanisms. Yeah, that I mentioned before that affect the variation from individual to individual. Right. So it's a it's a big issue. If you make a jump from fifteen hundred down to nine sixteen, that's insane. How many how many clin clinicians and researchers are looking at like, what well, was it the lab equipment that wasn't right. accurate before? That's a big jump. So so Jay I always asks the question, my patients and others, uh, we're producing less than ever. 
but do we need less than ever? Well, no. of course not. Absolutely. Our needs are probably greater than ever, ever in this in this toxic environment that we're in. Ever. So here's the LabCorp explanation of their change uh, with regard to their normative values. So as you can see, before July 17, 2017, the normal values at that time were 348 to 1197. And after this study came out, after July 17, 2017, the normal value became 264 to 916 Amazing. nanograms per deciliter. So there is a 281 nanogram per deciliter change in the upper end of normal. So what was normal in June of 2017, if you ran well at 1150, felt great, asymptomatic, living life great, come July, you were super physiologic and your dose was going to get lower. <laughs> Okay, so you understand this crazy notion of super physiologic, what, whatever that means this day and age with regards whatever to normative means. values. Right. Okay. So here we have the testosterone, uh, you know, therapy in men with hypogonadism. This is the Endocrine Society's clinical practice guideline. And so this is what most physicians uh, utilize in order to diagnose and treat uh, men for hypogonadism. So they recommend making a diagnosis of hypogonadism only in men with symptoms and signs consistent with testosterone deficiency and unequivocally and consistently low serum testosterone concentrations. They recommend measuring fasting morning total uh, testosterone con concentrations utilizing, utilizing an accurate and reliable assay as the initial diagnostic test. They also recommend confirming the diagnosis by repeating the measurement of morning fasting total T concentrations. So they want you morning and fasted by at least six hours. Why do they want you morning? Testosterone lower in the morning. Right. Why do they want you fasted? Food lowers testosterone. They Most want to measure you at your highest level. Exactly. And I do believe that's to restrict its use. No doubt about Absolutely it. Absolutely believe that. Once you are diagnosed, they suggest institute testosterone therapy. The, the, uh, the physician should aim at achieving testosterone concentrations in the mid-normal range during treatment. <laughs> so mid-normal range now with a normal value of 916 is going to be 450. Unbelievable. Okay, so let's aim for 450 nanograms per deciliter as our treatment goal. Incredible. They go on to point out the symptoms and signs of testosterone deficiency are nonspecific and modified by age, comorbid, comorbid illness, severity and duration of testosterone deficiency, and variations in androgen sensitivity and previous T therapy. This is the only time they mention in their guidelines variation in androgen sensitivity. Right. <laughs> but yet, Variations in androgen and sensitivity is not factored in the treatment guidelines whatsoever. And that's 40%. 40% yeah. variation from man to man right. is predicated on androgen insensitivity or sensitivity. Incredible. So if you also go to the Endocrine Society's website, you'll look if they have a whole section devoted to endocrine disrupting chemicals. And they'll talk about how much damage and, and havoc it's wreaking on our endocrine systems. But yet, that part of the endocrine society is not talking to the people that make the guidelines because these endocrine disruptive chemicals are not factored in to our treatment guidelines at all. It's purely lab based, lab based. Yeah. So here are the symptoms and signs suggested of T deficiency. Uh, the specific signs are incomplete or delayed sexual development, loss of body, hair, and very small testes. That's not really what we see in a clinical, uh, from a clinical standpoint in the men that we treat that which are adult males. But there are signs that are suggestive, um, you know, such as reduced sexual desire, decreased spontaneous erections. Those are two really big ones, along with erectile dysfunction. But most of the guys that you see and that you treat have what they call nonspecific symptoms and signs. Decreased energy, motivation, initiative, uh, feeling sad or blue, depressed mood, poor concentration, sleep uh, disturbance, increased sleepiness. Jay, you got, you got children, right? You got girls, right? You had girls, right? Boys, girls, got between girls, you and Monica, right? got them both, right? Yep. Two girls. No, just two girls. You know, I have boys. Yeah, Monica has boys. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, the sad thing is, is that uh, the, the symptoms are nonspecific, and that's what, you know, mainstream medicine looks so down on people treating because they're so nonspecific. They can be due to anything. And so, you know, I've been asked, you know, by another physician, tell me what 14-year-old girl or boy at some point in time couldn't read this list of nonspecific symptoms and, and complain of them. Right. Oh, you know, they That's go true. in the bedroom and sleep all day and, you know, they don't concentrate. And, you know, you hear where I'm going with that. Yes. So it can be a very difficult, difficult thing to treat. So the point that I'm making with that is that every man or woman that really reads that almost, a, 
no matter what age, if you remove the sexual symptoms, and we're just talking about, we're talking about young teenage people, you can convince yourself that you've got symptoms of testosterone deficiency. Right. And that'll come in later in what we're talking about. So Morgan Toller did write an op-ed about the current diagnostic, diagnostic criteria for testosterone deficiency and how they're inadequate. And he pointed out that it's important to recognize that there's no clear threshold for total T concentration that reliably, reliably separates men who have the condition from the, men's, from the men who don't, or that predicts who, or will not, who will or will not respond to treatment. So, you know, uh, we see men that come in with symptoms, their testosterone level is still within the normal range, since the normative range is down to 264 now, lower into normal, so everybody's almost normal. You have to ask yourself who will benefit from treatment. That's a question that, that we need to ask ourselves, and we need a better way of evaluating these men to determine who will respond to treatment. As he notes, there are some people that are going to get testosterone that don't really need it, and some that are going to be deprived of it that do need it. So, as he states, rather than attempting to determine whether a man has a normal or abnormal testosterone concentration, it would be more reasonable to ask, what is the likelihood that a symptomatic man with a particular T value would respond to treatment? Very good question to ask. Uh, the study was done by Wu et al. that used responses to clinical questionnaires, and we use clinical questionnaires, and blood test results from the European Male Aging Society, I mean study, to help define the condition. The best statistical fit was the combination of reduced erection quality, decreased libido, and decreased nocturnal erections combined with a serum testosterone concentration of 316 nanograms per deciliter. Okay? So why has it been so hard to establish a threshold? Well, as we know, there's great inter-individual variation in biology between men with testosterone, so that some men will be symptomatic at 300, some will be perfectly fine. It's also been postulated that the magnitude of the decline of the testosterone concentration in a given individual matters more than the absolute value. But the only way we would know that is if we had your testosterone levels measured 10, 20, 30 years ago. So we can see the magnitude of decline in you. Uh, he also notes, as Dr. Howell and I are, are researching, there's evidence that the angiogen receptor for varying degrees of sensitivity, determined by the number of CAG repeats. That's just one mechanism is the number of CAG repeats. And that total T is the wrong test. And I think we can agree on total T is the wrong test. Right. Uh, you know, I agree with Dr. Morgan Tyler, as do you and, and most other physicians in the field, that uh, free testosterone is the most accurate indicator of a man's androgen status. All right. So what does Dr. Morgan Tyler note that should be done, which Dr. Howell and I plan on doing? A key study to be performed is to take a population of men with a defined symptom or set of symptoms characteristic of testosterone deficiency and expose them to treatment regardless of baseline T levels. The goal of such a study is to determine the likelihood of symptomatic responses based on baseline concentrations of androgen tests, which at a minimum should include total T, free T, and bioavailable T. The most predictive of these will be the most clinically useful. Clinicians would do well to think about T levels providing information as to the likelihood of symptomatic response rather than a normal versus abnormal. By the way, when is this study from? This is uh, like 20, 15, 2016, I think you wrote this. So how come he never commissioned anything until, I mean, you guys are doing it, but well, how come it was never commissioned to do that? Uh, you know, he, I, I don't know. You know, it, it's, uh, as he notes in some other articles, it's very difficult uh, to study men with normal values. Right. And financial interests as yeah. well. I mean, it, it takes money to conduct studies. Yeah. So. All right. So let's get to, here's what I, I have to say on a daily and weekly basis, every man I talk to, every man that comes in with, it, with symptoms, is, <laughs> there are symptoms we want hormones to improve, and there are symptoms hormones are going to improve, and those are not always the same. Wow, that is a very uh, profound, powerful statement, and I know exactly where, where, where we can go with that. But uh, Yeah, I mean, if we need to have a discussion on that, we, we should, because uh, men start testosterone wanting and improving in a certain set of symptoms or have right. a certain set of goals right. uh, or expectations. And, uh, and when they're not met, they think testosterone doesn't work. Right. Well, that's, exactly. that's just not, that's not the case. No. And then you have fools that are telling them that they need their dose increased, increased, increased when they don't even know what the expectations of the actual hormone is. So it's, it's, a well, then, well, let me just say this, this is where, this is where coming, this is where working with a physician, who understands this and knows how to talk about lifestyle. Cause I mean, again, obviously that's all I ever talk about is like right. know, testosterone right. is an adjunct. That's it. 
Well, what you see in these men that are doing that is the, when it doesn't work, they, what do they do? They tweak their protocol, they mess with their doses, they add other substances, AIs, HCG, frequency of injection. I mean, once again, they literally are trying to drive a square peg into a round hole, ultimately. Right. And, okay. and obviously not getting good help and advice either. Right. And we're going to that, how that can happen as well. It's, it's not all their fault. So we'll, we'll talk about, you know, how, how things work out sometimes. Okay. So, you know, hormones won't improve symptoms unrelated to their deficiency. We're treating deficient uh, symptoms of a deficiency or an actual deficiency when we're doing hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. Correct. So no amount of hormone optimization will overcome negative lifestyle factors such as lack of sleep, stress, due to finances, bad job or marriage, poor <laughs> diet, alcohol or drug abuse, and lack of exercise. Right. Lifestyle has just as much importance on how we feel and function as hormones, right? Yeah. Hormones are our foundation of health. What I stress to everyone, and I would stress to any of your listeners, you, I would stress it to you, my family members, that before or you consider other substances, get your hormones, your baseline hormones in an optimal range. They are your foundation of health. Yeah. If, you, uh, if you build a house, you build it on a strong foundation. You build a golf swing, you build it on a strong foundation. If you don't build a strong foundation, which are your hormones, then everything crumbles in times of stress. Yeah. So get your hormones optimal first. And unfortunately, we see it time and time again, day in and day out, week to week. People come in that never have their hormones optimal right. or optimized. Well, that's the majority of patients. You already and know. then they turn to other substances, of course. Yes, they're going to want to use peptides or, or other, other – which Anything. Is, yeah. is it, use those once you have your hormones in an optimal range. Right. Okay? So, really, what is, what is optimal? It's where you feel your best function your best, perform your best, and are your healthiest for your age and your present medical status. Hormones aren't going to undo years of abuse, decades of abuse. Yeah. You know? uh, so, you know, you're never going to look and feel 18 again when you're 48. All right. You're, we try to make you the best you can be at 48. So realistic expectations are very important. So we're there to maximize your individual function. I love that definition, by the way. Did Scott come up with that? No, I did. <laughs> we do have a litmus test when you're optimized. <laughs> That's really good. So realistic expectations, Jay. We all know. We know. We all know about this. You deal with men all the time uh, that email you because you forward me those emails whenever they want to want to come see us, and we greatly appreciate that once again. But look, realistic expectations. Testosterone in itself is not like taking a stimulant like Adderall when you get up in the morning. It's not like taking an anabolic steroid a true anabolic steroid uh when you go to the gym it's not like taking high dose viagra every time you want to have intercourse and it's not like taking a sedative at night when you go to bed right it'll improve symptoms of the deficiency but a lot of men come in thinking that if they get on testosterone they will never be tired never have a day without an erection you know uh never you know get fatigued never not sleep eight hours a day they figure that they're going to be uh, this function on all cylinders 24 7 365 well and they will if they work with you yeah, no that's not real I'm, I'm trying to make it very clear that we're all human we're all you human. how many of you guys come in and say i just want to be like jay campbell man just I, well you like know jay that's campbell. you know what's, <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit you know you do you've done so much to help men but at the same time, they only see the, the Jay yeah. Campbell on, on right. the show, and they right. think that you're functioning on, on uh, you know, believe me, I at all the time. <laughs> and so even though you've helped them, there's this misperception yeah. that Jay Campbell you're, never no, gets he's, tired. He's literally never like, you don't know how crazy that motherfucker really is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I say, oh, no, look, I know Jay. He doesn't function on all cylinders at all times, okay? You know, he's, so. I'm glad you're saying that. It's totally true. And it's just what you see. So, you know, how many times do you see guys that say, you know, uh, I just want to feel great. Right. And I'll add, and you know, you, we spend an hour or two at least with, you'd get the emails back. Yeah. Yep. I mean, we spend a couple hours with each new patient. And a lot of that is, is discussing expectations and please define what feeling great means. I mean, right. I really want to know what their definition of, of great is. Right. Uh, you know, some guys will also say, well, I really don't think it's doing what I think it should be doing. Well, <laughs> Tell me what you think it should be doing. Let me hear those expectations to see if they're actually realistic. Uh, one guy, he had been to seven clinics, Jay, seven clinics when he saw me. And I had his levels beautiful, as good as they've ever been. 
And I called him back and uh, he was like, well, I just don't think I'm just doing what it should be doing. It still could be better. And I'm like, well, on your sheet, everything is perfect. There's no symptoms that you're marking other than morning erections, a mild, you know, decrease morning erections. And he goes, yeah, but I don't have one every day. And I'm like, you're 35 years old. He go, and I said, are you literally telling me that you define optimal as having an erection every single day? And he says, well, yeah. And I said, so you're 35. The average lifespan was, was for the sake of argument, is mid 70s, 75. So I asked him, I said, so you're telling me that you don't consider yourself optimal unless for the next 40 years, 365 days a year, you wake up with an erection. And when you asked him like that, his, his response was, well, when you put it like that, I guess not. Right. So really it's dealing with uh, expectations and making them realistic and what it does and what it doesn't do uh, is a big part of hormone optimization. And, uh, yeah. you know, and it's just uh, a lot of guys will hear things they don't want to hear. And that, it's yeah. unfortunate, but you have to be truthful with them up front. Yep. Uh, so, uh, so that's, you know, that's my take on that. You want to, I think that the best patients that, that I really see the ones that are uh, that benefit the most are, are middle-aged and older men like, like I was when I went through it, right. is that you are so rock bottom. Yeah. You are so just, you know. You're, well, they'll listen and they'll do what you tell them. Yeah, and they have no expectations. All they know is they're miserable. They're a shell of the person that they were. And if you just take them away from that, great to them is not feeling sick anymore. Keith, the worst, that's so well said. The worst thing that ever happened, and you know this better than anybody, is the fucking internet. Yeah, and oh yeah. These people could listen to you, listen to me, listen to Scott, listen to Dr. Rob, listen to Dr. Neil and get the best advice ever. And then literally go home that night and go on to one of the forums or some bro science BS and read what some other idiot says and literally disregard everything you just told them. They do it all the time. Uh, you know, I don't get on there anymore. We don't have time. Of course. But, you know, there's nothing worse than when they would go to a physician and come on and say, hey, I just went to Dr. X and here's my protocol. Critique it. Tell me what I should do. <laughs> and it just, you know, those guys, I mean, we're going to get into some things that can occur when men get like that, that are, that are real life scenarios with patients. So, you know, so I think it's very important that, you know, if you, that's crazy. I'll tell you, by the time these guys have come see me from out of state that have been to so many clinics, they literally just say, I'm tired of thinking about just it. Anymore. I've been chasing all these variables and these different parameters. Just tell me what to do. Just help me and I'll do it. And, right. and when they do, they, they do well. It works. Yeah. When they can just let it all go and unlearn what they previously learned. That's what I ask them. You've got to unlearn what you learned. We, we all did. Look, I, I'm a, yeah, I, know, I, I took know, an AI. I, I took an AI. I could, I could control my estrogen better than anyone. Uh, so I took it. <laughs> All right. 